Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Cambridge Muslims College Quran series. Inshallah, we're going to be starting in just a few moments to allow everybody to join us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Welcome everybody to Cambridge Muslims College Quran Ramadan series. We're very happy to have all of you here, alhamdulillah. As some of you may know, Cambridge Muslim College is an independent institution of higher education and it is a registered charity. And we hope, inshallah, with the generosity of our friends and patrons from across the UK and beyond, that you'll be able to join us and be part of this uh, series with us, inshallah ta'ala. We hope, inshallah, that you're going to become a friend to Cambridge Muslim College and also um, contribute from your ch generosity, charity, and zakat, inshallah, to benefit this college. Today, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to be joining you for a weekly program that is focused on understanding the Quran as part of our Ramadan series here at Cambridge Muslim College. My topic in particular, inshallah, focuses on healing in the Qur'an, and I hope, inshallah, that we find all of this to be good reminders, but also a sense of healing for all of us, inshallah ta'ala. As I look to stories of the Qur'an, one of the first that pops to mind, honestly, as a woman and as a mother, are the stories of the mothers in the Qur'an and how many trials that they have faced and the healing that they have found through the Quran, through the words of God. I'd like to start our story today with the story of the mother of Musa, alayhi salam. The story of the mother of Musa is one that we all know. Likely there are parts of the story that we're familiar with, but I'd like to delve into it today from a point of view of healing, particularly. Certainly the mother of Musa is one of the greatest testimonies to the verse in the Qur'an, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى Indeed, with hardship comes ease. And I point us out the word ma'a, which means with. Many people, when they come to translate this verse, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى they translate it as, indeed with hardship, indeed after hardship comes ease, instead of with hardship. And actually the verse is, with hardship comes ease, they come together. If only we are able to actually understand that with every trial, every tribulation, every difficulty that comes tucked underneath it and tucked within it is ease. Sometimes it's not directly visible to us and sometimes we, not, we cannot see this immediately. And it takes some prayer and wisdom 
and tawakkul reliance on Allah to really see what's happening. So let's share, inshallah, together a little deeper on the story of the mother of Musa, alayhi salam. At this point in time in the story, we understand that Fir'aun, the pharaoh, was, had seen a dream in which he knew that his position would be at stake. And he would be eventually ousted by a son, a boy, from Bani Israel. And he had commanded that in those years, that those boys all be murdered. And so he was murdering all the sons of Bani Israel. And in that year, the mother of Musa gave birth to Prophet Musa alayhi salam, and she feared for his son's life. And by the command of Allah, she receives instruction from God to put Prophet Musa alayhi salam into the Nile River, not knowing where this basket is going to go, what's going to become of her newborn son. Imagine being the mother who fears already for the life of your son, and then receives commandment from God to just put your son in flowing waters. The Quran describes this moment and says, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنِ رُضِعِيهِ فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّ رَادُّوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ I'll translate. And we inspired the mother of Musa, suckle him, nurse him. But when you fear for him, put him into the river and do not fear and do not grieve. Indeed, will we will return him to you and make him one of the messengers. Now imagine, imagine the pain in a mother's heart. Already knowing your son is at risk for murder, and many other boys have been murdered. And imagine the heart of a mother that has to place her newborn son into a basket in flowing waters, not knowing where he will go. And so the Quran describes the emotional state of Ummi Musa, the mother of Musa. The Quran says, وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا إِنْ كَادَتْ أَنْ تُبْدِي بِهِ لَوْ لَا أَنْ رَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Ya Allah. I'll translate. The Quran says, The heart of the mother of Musa ached so much. Huh? Ached so much that she almost gave away his identity. And then Allah Azza wa Jal said, had we not reassured her heart, had we not reassured her heart in order for her to have faith in Allah's promise. I'm going to pause for a moment. This verse is so powerful. Today, sisters and brothers, when we look at what's happening in the world around us, one of the biggest trials in modern human history is witnessing a genocide unfold right before your eyes. And feeling helpless and feeling you're seeing live death and murder and destruction daily in the palms of your hands. These phones, these computers, live, in real time. A few weeks ago, I was in Qatar for a conference, an Islamic psychology conference. And I was told there is a woman, a psychologist, a professor like myself, who was going to be coming to this conference and she's from Gaza and she wants to meet you. And I said, I'd be honored. Now comes the conference and it's the midst of the day of the conference and people are exchanging salam and introducing themselves one to another. 
And amongst the women that were I was introduced to and being in, introducing myself to is a woman who approached and said, Dr. Rania, I'm Dr. Shema. And I said, wonderful to meet you. And then she said again, I'm Dr. Shema. It didn't register for me until she said the third time, I'm Dr. Shema from Gaza. And I stopped and realized that it didn't register for me because like all the other women in this, all the other men and women, people around us, she had a huge smile on her face. You wouldn't know that just days ago, weeks ago, she had been pulled out of the rubble, not once, twice. And in each of these incidents, through them, she lost her entire family. Mother, father, husband, every child, siblings, everybody. Lost her home, of course her work. She had been a professor in the Department of Psychology in the Islamic University of Gaza. And I said to her, please, 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 please come sit down. And as she sat down to tell her story, and all of us very earnestly listening, because we had seen these pictures and horrific images through our phones, but to meet someone in the flesh is different. And she said to a sister who was sitting next to me that asked her, Dr. Shema, how are you even able to tell the story you were pulled out of the rubble and everyone died except you. How? How are you smiling? You know what she said? This verse. This verse right here. She said, It's in the words of Allah Azza wa Jal describing what he did to the mother of Musa. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, لَوْلَا أَنْ رَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Had we not reassured her heart in order for her to have faith in Allah's promise. When Dr. Shaymat said these exact same words, chills, 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 chills. And you look at the face of a living today person, not a historical story it's today. And to understand that the Quran is not merely words, it's not merely stories, it is healing in itself. It is nur, it is light. It is the words of Allah Azza wa Jal himself. And when we hear these words, not just with our ears, but with our hearts, there is healing. Even in the most impossible situations. I know you're going to wonder about Dr. Shema and how she was even in Qatar in the first place. We asked her this. And she said, after all the rubble, She went from, she was alone in the world. Nothing, nobody, no family, no house, no job, no food, no wealth, nothing, 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 nothing. And she said the kindness of strangers that would let you stay in their tent for a little bit or you find an empty room, classroom in an abandoned building for just a night. And the cold, cold, she said, you've never felt cold like this. But Ramadan is here upon us and she said, we think we understood what hunger was when we fast, but you don't understand hunger like this. You don't understand hunger of people who don't eat. Nothing. There's nothing to eat day after day after day. Thirst that you've never felt before. She said, you don't know what it's like to only have salty water to drink from the sea.
And we keep drinking it because it's the only thing there, but the salty water makes us more thirsty. Thirsty that you've never felt. Hunger that you've never felt. Taking a tomato, because that was all she could find, and trying to make some food out of it. And all she could find was hand sanitizer, gel. And she mushed them together into some sort of salad to eat. She said, we hadn't seen bread for days and days and weeks. And when someone finally found a piece of bread or made some bread and they shared it, I got a fourth of a piece. And when they put it in my hand, I was amazed. I took the first bite, alhamdulillah. And then I was so astounded by it. I just kept taking pictures of it. And she showed me on her phone. She said, look, look, look at the pictures, all the pictures of bread. That piece of bread I took, it's like when they put it in my hand, they put a gold bar in my hand. You don't know hunger, even though we're fasting. Then she said, one day I saw a little kid with a biscuita, a cookie, crossing the street. And she said, I, I was so hungry. I was so hungry. I literally wanted the biscuit, that little cookie out of the child's hand. We keep asking her, how, how are you still talking, smiling? And this is all she could say. Allah has reassured my heart. My heart was like the heart of Um Musa. It ached so much. That was her explanation. So how did I meet her in Qatar? I asked her this and she said, I was alone in the world, nobody. When I realized as they pulled me out of the rubble the second time, they told me everybody had died, everybody, and that she was the only one alive. She cried and cried and cried. And she said, the people around me thought I was crying for the family members who passed. And she said, no. She said, no, that's not why I'm crying. I'm not crying because they are martyrs. They are shuhada. They are in Jannah. I, there's no tears. I am, I am crying because... I'm asking Allah, what did I do that I couldn't have been a martyr like them? Imagine, imagine, imagine. And then she said, people around her started saying to her, there is something Allah wants of you, Dr. Shema, that he still wants something from you on this earth before he takes you. And so I asked her, Dr. Shema, what was your specialty in psychology before all of this happened? What did you teach at the university? What was your work and research in? She said to me, trauma. Trauma of warfare. And working with children. She was contacted because she said, I was alone, I have no family, nobody. And there were all these children who were parentless, alone in the world and injured. And she said, I got paired up to be a surrogate mother to a little girl who had a cast on every one of her four limbs. And they told me, accompany her to Qatar so that she can go through medical surgeries and physical rehab and things that she needs to take care of medically. And she said, they think that I'm helping her, but in reality, she's helping me. And I've she's become like my daughter, the daughter I lost, the many children I've lost. And that's what she was doing in Qatar. And then she said, they discovered that I have a degree and psychology specific to trauma and working with children. 
And we all said to her, this is what Allah still needs of you. May Allah accept from her and accept from all those who have been martyred, all those who have lost family, all those who have lost so much, all those who are oppressed in every corner of this earth, across our ummah and across humanity. And I go back to our verse here in the Quran. And we have reassured her heart that she have faith in Allah's promise. I say it again, these words of the Quran that are getting our sisters and brothers in Gaza and Palestine and other corners of this earth through their oppression and difficulty. That is healing them, allow it to heal us too. Let us listen to the Quran, not just with our ears. Let us read the Quran, not just with our eyes. Let us understand the Quran, not just with our mind, but with our hearts. Because you see the effect I saw it in real time. It was like I was talking to the mother of Musa in real time, saying, Healing. There is healing in this Quran. And if we come back to the mother of Musa, alayhi salam, the story continues. And it continues because Allah wills for this baby that is in the basket to make its way to the very palace, subhanAllah, the very palace of the tyrant that the mother of Musa was trying to avoid. But Allah is surely the best of planners. And appears into the story a second woman also will become a mother, as we'll talk about in a moment. And this is none other than the wife of Pharaoh himself, Sayyida Asiya. And she takes in baby Musa, alayhi salam, adopts him, raises him as her own son. The very person that Pharaoh himself fears is raised in his palace. SubhanAllah. This is only Allah. And the generosity of Allah extends because it prevents baby Musa from accepting milk from any woman who tries to nurse him. And it happens to be with Allah's planning that the sister of Musa is working in the palace and witnessing all of this and is able to recommend the mother of Musa as a wet nurse. And Allah Azza wa Jal captures the story in the Quran and says, وَحَرَّمْنَ عَلَيْهِ الْمَرَاضِيعَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَقَالَتْ هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ يَكْفُلُونَهُ يَكْفُلُونَهُ لَكُمْ وَهُمْ لَهُ نَاصِحُونَ And Allah says we caused him to refuse all the wet nurses at first. And so his sister suggests, shall I direct you to a family who will bring him up for you and take good care of him. SubhanAllah. And Allah has reassured her heart, the heart of the mother of Musa is soothed, is put at ease. She's reunited with her baby. She gets to raise him herself, knowing that he's going to be safe from the brutal killing of Pharaoh. See, oftentimes we face circumstances in our life where we feel stranded little control over the situation at hand. You hear, you see here the story of the prophet Musa's mother. And we're reminded that we don't necessarily always know Allah's plan. We can't necessarily always understand why things are happening. But when we don't know the plan, we must trust the planner. Because Allah Azza wa Jal is the greatest of planners. He is al-mudabbir. And he will mold our trials and our resilience into beautiful outcomes. And he says, Azza wa Jalla, in the Quran, 
ما ودعك ربك وما قلا. We're reminded that our Lord has not forsaken us. Trust in your Lord. Know that with hardship, with hardship comes ease. They come together, not one after another. And when we think about these verses in the Quran and the kind of healing that they're able to provide and have provided people the greats before us, it is important that when we read the Quran, we read from a place of depth of iman, of faith, even if you don't know. One of my main du'as that I tend to make is, Ya Allah, you are boss. You are boss. You are boss. Help me understand the wisdom of your decisions. Rabbi, even when I don't know, help me learn and believe and have faith that you do, that you know what you're doing in your divine wisdom. And allow me the gratitude and the service to you to know that. There is another woman in the story that shows up, another mother, a surrogate mother in this case, and that is none other than Sayyida Asya, and I'd like to talk about her and some of the verses relating to her as well. Because Sayyida Asya's story is a story of immense trial and healing. She is the wife of Fir'aun, as we mentioned, one of the most oppressive oppressive human beings ever. The story of Fir'aun shows up so often in the Qur'an as a reminder to all of us what oppression can look like and how Allah can turn it around in his might. His wife, Sayyida Asya, is honored in the Qur'an, whereas Fir'aun is depicted as the most detestable tyrant. Sayyida Asya is depicted as one of the greatest women of all time, a woman of Jannah, guaranteed Jannah, a pious and devoted woman, like polar opposites. She's devoted and believes in Allah Azza wa Jal, despite living in the oppressive court of Fir'aun. She's a queen. She lives her whole life in luxury and riches. And if you know anything about ancient Egypt, <laughs> you know that if you're in that palace, it was luxury and it was riches. All the wealth this world can offer. And when the basket with Sayyidina Musa, baby Musa, floats down the river and lands in her palace and she takes him in and raises him as her own, she knows. She's aware of the rage of her husband's anger and what can happen. And she also knows his rage when she declares her faith in the one God, Allah, and she supports Sayyidina Musa when he comes back to deliver the message to Fir'aun. And here is the most brutal human to ever walk the earth. And despite this, Sayyida Asya chooses to stand up against him, show her faith, even though she knew she was risking her own life. Now, Fir'aun was so enraged by her faith that he orders her torture. And there is such a thing as abuse in the home, and this was inside and outside, because what he did is he put her, her torture as public humiliation. She, he tortured her in public to humiliate her, and to make an example out of her. And here she is, once queen, in front of all the people that she once ruled, tortured, humiliated. And in the midst of all of this, she keeps calling on the one God and denying Fir'aun. And when she says in the Qur'an, Captures has to be said by all of us. A dua, a prayer 
that has to be said by all of us. She says, My Lord, build for me a house near you in paradise. Allah hears her. He elevates her. And there she is, tortured. That's what people can see. But what she sees is Allah opens realms of the unseen that we can't see, invisible to us. But she can see her home in Jannah. So as she's experiencing that torture, all she experiences actually is seeing her home in Jannah. And Allah, just as Fir'aun attempted to make an example out of her, of humiliation towards the people, Allah makes a better, bigger example out of her as an honored woman in the Qur'an to be remembered until the Day of Judgment. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجْنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجْنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Oh Allah, build for me a house near you in paradise and deliver me from Fir'aun and his evil doings and save me from the wrongdoing people. And Allah answers. Not only does she get to raise Prophet Musa, one of the greatest human beings that Allah has ever sent on earth, and be one of his mothers, the surrogate mother, but she stands up against injustice and against the greatest tyrant of her time and of many eras. And amidst all of that torture, all she can see is her home in Jannah, and all she can feel is her nearness to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah does not forget the pains of his servants. Every pain is rewarded with a greater reward than what this world has to offer. The greatest test is remembering to remember our Lord. Especially in trying times, especially in difficult times such as the ones we're in right now. And it's important that we constantly train our hearts with dhikr, with dhikr. So that when the pains, the trials, the tribulations come our way, the first things uttered out of our mouth is dhikr, is remembrance of Allah. Hasbi Allah wa na'am al wakil. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Alhamdulillah. You can't do that in a moment of trial and tribulation unless you've trained your tongue and your heart to do so. Not curse words. Dhikr. Because in those moments, that's what's going to show. In those moments, will you be the Dr. Shayma of today that's going to say, Rabatallahu ala qalbi. May we all be strong, like Asiya, radiallahu anha, resilient, like the mother of Musa, grounded in the face of oppression and injustice. This deen, this Qur'an has allowed our sisters and brothers across the ummah and across time to be able to hold on to the rope of Allah in such difficult, difficult moments. It has allowed people today amongst us to pick up this Qur'an and start reading it, trying to figure out where does all of that faith and resilience of the Ghazans, of the Palestinians come? Where is it coming from? And now that we're in Ramadan, do you know how many people, not Muslim around us, are fasting in solidarity? Because they're saying, what is this religion that gives you the kind of resilience, the kind of discipline, that even in the face of oppression, you still pray five times a day. You fast from sun up to sundown. You give in charity anything you have. What is this religion? What is this way of life? Is the better question. SubhanAllah. And as I wrap up this section, 
we must then talk about Sayyidina Musa himself. Because Sayyidina Musa, his story is repeated in the Quran the most. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told by Allah azza wa jal that it is because the people of Musa is most like the people of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that his struggles, Sayyidina Musa's struggles are so similar to the struggles of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's us. That's us, me and you. So let us turn for a few minutes to look at some of the verses that talk about Sayyidina Musa and healing there too. Because he is the, he is the one who's in the basket, who grows up in the palace of Fir'aun. He is the one that knows his identity is from Bani Israel, but at the same time is raised in the palace of the Pharaoh and can speak that language and understands that story, that way of life. And then he's cast out and then given the message from Allah to give, to, to give the message of the one God to Fir'aun. <laughs> And it's heavy. And it's heavy. How do you face the most unjust tyrant known to mankind? The same man who wants to kill you. Allah is telling you, go and speak to him. And bring his wrongdoings to light and give him the message of Islam. Of one God. Of submission to God. There is a famous dua in the Quran that we know and I'd like to remind us of. And just like the previous one, I want us to have memorized and used often. It is a dua of healing. Sayyidina Musa says, in calling to Allah, praying to him, he says, Qal, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. My Lord, uplift my heart for me. Make my task easy. Remove the impediment from my tongue so people may understand my speech. And there's more to this prayer. We'll come to that in a moment. But imagine, imagine being difficult, given this difficult task. Imagine being given the task of going to the doorstep of the very person who wanted you dead and telling him, you're wrong. <laughs> Knowing that he is capable of immediate destruction and murder. It's the unimaginable command where Allah says to Sayyidina Musa, اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى Go to Fir'aun, indeed he has transgressed. The Prophet Musa doesn't doubt the command of Allah. He doesn't doubt why Allah is giving him this message. But he's scared. He's human. He's human. A prophet, the best of humans, but human. And he asks Allah to help equip him mentally and emotionally to withstand the heavy task in front of him. As I mentioned, many of us have the first part of this du'a memorized. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. What about the part that comes after? Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahlal uqtata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Waj'al li waziran min ahli. Haruna akhi. And grant me a helper from my family, my brother Harun. See, Sayyidina Musa realizes this task, and this is so important for all of us, all of us here, he realizes the task in front of him is massive and that he needs external support. He has called upon Allah's support internally. Hold me, Ya Rabbi, help me. But he also needs external support. This is humility. I talk to so many people. I counsel and work with so many people. And in this field of mind of mental health, many people feel they can do things alone. They should be able to do it alone by themselves. I don't need to call for help or support. 
this is arrogance many times. Or there are these strange cultural narratives and expectations and cultural, what I like to say, cultural nonsense that tells us we have to be strong always and forever and do this all by yourself, especially a woman. Men too. But the concept of superwoman is a powerful thing that I talk about often and how it's ridiculous. And many men are raised culturally to say, pick yourself up and never show weakness. Sayyidina Musa was not weak. Sayyidina Musa was humble. And in that humility, he realized he needed external support and help. He thinks of his brother, who's still in Egypt, Harun. He's talented. He's a fluent speaker. Sayyidina Musa had somewhat of a speech impediment. And he knew that if he can go with his brother together to speak to Fir'aun, it would be a little bit easy. The impossible would become somewhat possible. Some people of the scholars of Islam and Mumafassirun, those who do the exegesis of the Quran and explain it, they say there is no powerful dua that a human can do to another the way what Musa did to his brother Harun. Because in asking Allah to send Harun, he made him from a, a, a righteous man to another prophet. He made him a prophet. <laughs> and they go together. Harun goes as an emotional support to Sayyidina Musa. How often do we find ourselves trying to do it all? We're too shy or we're too worried or we're simply having a difficult time admitting and asking for help from others, even when we need it. Perhaps it's not easy, right? And many of us feel that we would show some weakness. But I want to remind you of the example of Sayyidina Musa and how he found healing through support and help. He asked Allah for internal aid and also asked him for external aid. And all the while being grounded in what Allah tasked him with, an unwavering conviction to complete his task. We learn from Sayyidina Musa السلام, that it's human to be scared, to be worried. It is human to need the help of others. We have to remember that help comes with and from the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal. So when tribulations in this life start to weigh you down, we need to use the most powerful tool that Allah has given us. And that is the power of dua. The power of dua. The scholars of Islam say the strongest of the dua are those that are found directly in the Quran, such as the ones we just described. رَبِّ بِنِ لِي بَيْعَنْدَكَ بَيْتَ الْجَنَّةِ رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسْرِ لِي أَمْرِي and so on. Come next is the prophetic du'as, the du'as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make. And then comes the du'as from your own heart, your own tongue. I often tell my students, I like to call these du'as freestyle du'as. <laughs> Many people have never learned to talk to God directly, in their own words, in their own language. Just talk to God. Just, just talk to God. Ask him in your words, as broken as crumbled, as broken as you feel, as crumbling as you feel, to provide you that aid internally and externally, that support and that love, that assistance, because he's never going to test us with more than we can handle. What does that mean, people ask? And I'll close with this. It means that when Allah sends us a tribulation, a trial, when we witness oppression, difficulties, it means that he's not leaving us stranded. And sometimes the support comes internally, and sometimes the support comes externally. Or both. The people in your life 
professionals who could potentially help you. And yes, I'm going to go there with professional mental health support when needed. The teachers, spiritual guides, friends, a suhba saliha, suhba amina, a righteous companionship. It requires humility and it requires a deep sense of faith that Allah has not abandoned you and will not abandon you. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى But Allah will never forsake us, even in the most difficult moments. And so with that, I ask all of you to keep me in your du'as. Forgive me for any shortcomings I've made here. And also to please, when you read the Qur'an this Ramadan, tune into its healing messages. Tune into what aspects of these verses that you're reading, what are the stories behind them? Delve deeper. And when you come across du'as, prayers, that the greats before us have made and is, have healed their hearts, hold on to them. Write them in your little journal. Keep them and use them in your prayers. And with that, inshallah, we'll have some time now for question and answer. You're welcome to put your questions in the um, chat box on the YouTube, and I'm happy to take some of those questions as time allows. And with that too, before we formally close, I'd like to say um, this: these sessions happen every day at 5 p.m. GMT in Ramadan, just like today. I will be on every Friday, inshallah, for the messages of healing from the Qur'an. But you have so many other greats from Cambridge Muslim College who will also be giving messages every single day of the week. So please make sure you tune in to those as well. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een. Now, further questions. Bismillah. Some of your questions here ask, as a non-Arab speaker, how can we connect with the Qur'an? I'm standing in Tarawih, but struggling to feel and find its healing. I feel you. I really do. I want to share with you the miracle of the Qur'an. You're right in sometimes not being able to fully understand. And subhanAllah, you, would, you wouldn't believe, but I must admit to you that even Arabic speakers, even Arabic speakers, don't fully, fully, fully capture everything that's happening in the Qur'an either, although they can capture a certain amount. Some of the greatest scholars of the Arabic language and of Arabic grammar, of tafsir of the Qur'an, its exegesis and explanations, and translation for that matter, were non-Arabic speakers too. What is the secret? They spent time learning it, reading it, delving deeper into its stories. And so it may not happen in the you know, hour or so you spend standing in tarawih. But outside of it, you have all the other hours to really try your best to understand its meanings. I find that when people make an intention, this is what our spiritual teachers have taught us, they make an intention, oh Allah, open your doors for me. One door opens after another, after another. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal tells us through the Hadith Qudsi of the Prophet وسلم, that if we take a step towards Allah Azza wa Jal, He comes walking. And when we go walking, He comes at speed. And the rest of the Hadith is beautiful until He becomes the eyes with which we see and the ears with which we hear and so on. It is the most beautiful concept of knowing that if you take the first step, even this question, even you asking this question here is the first step of saying, I'm not connecting. How do I connect? That is the first step. Because what follows it is intention. And intention is the first thing we do in any of the worship, any of the ibadah of Islam. Inna bin Actions are only by their intention. And so make the intention today, you and me right now, all of us together. Oh Allah, help us understand the meaning of the Qur'an. Ya Allah, grant us teachers to teach us Arabic teach us the meanings of the Qur'an. 
oh Allah, grant me the companionships and friendships and halaqas and classes to allow me to be supported in my journey and learning the meaning of the Qur'an. Today you may stand not fully understanding what's being said in Tarwiyah. But with this intention and a few years of hard work, you might be better than all of us combined. And if I had the time, I would share with you stories of my own teachers who do not come from my Arabic speaking background, who, had, who have become <laughs> masters in the Quran. And I'm not asking for all of us to become necessarily masters, but definitely have some literacy in it. Many sisters and brothers have been spending Quran reading it, the tafsir, meaning the translation or its exegesis. And I encourage you to do the same. Many of our young people in the youth groups that I'm connected to, they are um, using apps that actually have the Arabic verse and immediately underneath it, the English, or every word gives you its translation, right? And they're able to kind of like toggle between the two. And as they're reading the Arabic, because they're trying to get through a khatam of reading, they are also understanding, at least in this case, the English language, what is being said. So I hope that's useful, inshallah ta'ala. Allah, Allah. Okay. Another more some more questions, inshallah. MashaAllah. There are questions related to the wisdoms. There's a number of them, kind of I'll group them together. They are the wisdoms behind the wisdom behind calamities that afflict us. And some are asking about the wisdom of what's happening in Palestine specifically. And I share with you what I said previously. That Allah Azza wa Jal has a divine understanding that sometimes we do not. And he, we may see the wisdom of it today and now, but we may also not. And that's important to realize that it may not happen in our lifetime. But there is something Allah is setting now or potentially later. And it may also happen immediately, but it may be at distance. The person of faith of Iman understands that calamities come not just to harm, but also to heal. Even those of us who study psychology and work on trauma, there is something called traumatic or post-traumatic growth. There is a growing edge that may happen after calamities come for the person who's asking, what about the wisdom? What is the wisdom behind calamities? You may grow and grow immensely. The great scholar, sheikh, and poet known as Rumi, and those who know him only as a poet, you've missed out on so much of who he actually is, had a beautiful line in his poetry where he says, light, and the meaning of which, light enters from an open wound. Sometimes there has to be a wound and opening that allows the light to enter. We saw this, and I continue to see this, with every person that has picked up the Qur'an yesterday here on our campus, the university I teach in, they have iftars every night. Hundreds, hundreds of people. I don't think the students were expecting three, four hundred people to show up where the iftar is. And... I was told that since things in Palestine, all the all this, all of this genocide that has started, now running on six months plus, there have been multiple people who have started to read the Quran, multiple, multiple who are fasting in solidarity, and many of them, at least a dozen, have been standing in Tarawih. And I said, what? <laughs> what do you mean standing in Tarawih? And they said, yes, they're very seriously considering Islam. And I was like, it's one thing to fast and to read the Quran, but we Muslims have a hard time standing in Tarawih. What do you mean they're standing in Tarawih? A wound was opened and light has been entering. Hold on to the rope of Allah. Keep praying to Allah to show you the wisdom behind the calamities. And for those who are asking, how do we keep on living life when things are happening in Palestine? I give you the words of Dr. Shayma because she's directly from Gaza and pulled herself out of the rubble twice. 
And she lives to tell us, we don't need your tears. We need your activism. We need you to get up and to say something and to do something. And everyone here has something different. For the person asking, how do I, how do I continue living this good life, feeling guilty when my Palestinian sisters and brothers are suffering? What do I do? I'll tell you what Dr. Shema says. She says, if you can write, write. If you can call, call. If you can talk, talk. If you have a social media platform, post. If you are a creative content creator, create. Do what you can. This is their request. And I'm merely carrying the message. May Allah grant all of us, all of us, Jimmy Ann, ease and turn our tribulations and calamities and difficulty into healing. May Allah grant us the kind of reassurance that she felt after intense, unimaginable calamity. And that's the last question I'll take is dovetailing on exactly this point. And it asks, how do we channel what we learn, the intellect of the heart and to the limbs? As in, you know you should be doing something, but there's a disconnect. Thank you for this question. Thank you for this question. This question is powerful. Why? Because it is so true and so human. We learn all these great things. Our spiritual teachers, my spiritual teachers would say, people love to learn. They'll show up to classes. They'll listen. They love when the light bulb goes off. Oh, that's an amazing thought. We go to conferences, we go to halakas, we listen in, we tune in. But then do we actually act upon what we learn? One of my du'as that I often make and those of my halakas know, I say, Oh Allah, do not make us, do not allow us to be from the hypocrites. Those who learn and do not do upon what they have learned. And what that means is, there's a dua in Arabic. It says, Allahumma ja'alna ulama amilin. Those who are knowledgeable and do upon their knowledge. This is where the disconnect comes in. Where you can't just sit on all this knowledge, notes and notes and copious knowledge that we have, but you actually have to take to the next step of implementing in your life. So inshallah ta'ala, I am going to say to you, one of the main ways of doing this, of getting it all connected, is continue to show up. Show up to the spiritual gatherings. Keep the company of the righteous. Be in the company of teachers who are doing upon what they're teaching, not just talking. Inshallah. And make sure that you are, even with your activism, make sure it's balanced by excellent commitment to Islam and to its practice. Because this theoretical without actual lived experience of the dunya, right? All this Islamic knowledge without lived experience is limited. And activism without being grounded in Islam is going to be very problematic. And we've seen this. So bring the two together, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide me and you, accept from me and you, allow you to have me and you to have an excellent Ramadan, the best of Ramadans yet. And may Allah azza wa jal allow me and you, inshallah, to be of aid of, to those who are oppressed, find healing in the Qur'an for ourselves and for our sisters and brothers in faith and in humanity. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala al-hadhi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Please continue to tune in every day of the week at 5 p.m. GMT. And inshallah, we'll see you in coming weeks. Barakallahu feekum, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.